There's this little DVD that uh, was done by the American Law School, which is kind of raises uh, a multitude of issues for us. And I thought I would play parts of it, and then we'll just pause it, and and we'll talk a little bit about uh, where the jumping off points are from there. My name is Stephen A. Isaacs, and I am Director of Character and Fitness for the Board of Bar Examiners. The hearing today is for the purpose of allowing you to address the committee in regard to the issues that were set forth in the notice uh, to you. Let me address you to the members of the committee. To my right is Monica Phillips, a member of the committee, and to my left is Bob Dinnerstein, a member of the committee. To his left is Christina Hilton, who will serve as court reporter for the purpose of transcribing uh, these proceedings. Specifically, you, the applicant, have the burden of proof. You must prove by clear and convincing evidence that you have the moral character and integrity and general fitness necessary to fulfill the duties and responsibilities of a practicing attorney. These issues will be resolved by the Character and Fitness Committee. For the record, do you understand the procedure and are you prepared to proceed? This guy's pretty serious about it, isn't he? You know, this is the Virginia uh, Quality and Fitness a panel of their Board of Law Examiners that are, is doing this fitness hearing. Uh, so you all kind of fall into one of three groups. And there's one group of folks who have gotten into trouble with stress uh, even before they got to law school and have had to deal with stuff. And uh, they are folks who've had to put stuff on their bar application about maybe seeing a doctor for depression or for going to treatment for addiction. Uh, and actually this is kind of the fortunate group <laughs> because they have, they have arrived early at the reality that we all live in that Dean Emery was talking about that, that life is stressful and it, if at different points it's going to affect us in a way that we're going to have difficulties. So. Uh, Y'all may know Jim Leffler here, who's director of Virginia's program, similar to what I do, Lawyers Helping Lawyers in Virginia. Uh, so what's really important here is if you fall in the first group, if you've had difficulties in the past that you're going to have to disclose to the bar examiners, uh, you want to get in touch with Jim. I don't think there have been any law students that have contacted me about a difficulty with uh, that they perceive as a difficulty that they're putting on their bar application that we've had a chance to work with before they got to the Board of Law Examiners who has not been admitted to the bar. So the, the mistake you will make if you're in that first group is not getting in touch with the professional organization that's used to helping people uh, in recovery from depression or addiction uh, so that you will have somebody who can go to bat for you when you're applying for the bar. Uh, I just hate it when this, you know these third year students come in <laughs> a month before the bar or you know when they're doing their application and they've got some problem that if if they'd come a year earlier, I could have a track record with them so I could do an affidavit for them with the Board of Law Examiners. The nature of a lot of these illnesses are such that, you know, I can't, there's no way for me to have an evaluation and project what the outcome is going to be down the line. I can only do it based on having some experience of working with somebody over some period of time. So if there are issues like that, uh, and I don't know what Jim's experience is in Virginia, but the Board of Law Examiners are delighted to see somebody who's had a, an issue that's a, a problem in their life and they've come to grips with it and they've dealt with it and, you know, they want to be a lawyer. Uh, what, is, what is very difficult at this stage is if, if you wait too long to do that and you can't tie in with a professional organization early enough for, we to, for us to do it. What happens in North Carolina a lot is they will say, well, Don, we want you to evaluate this uh, hopefully soon-to-be lawyer and monitor that lawyer for some period of time to be sure that they're getting the help that they need. 
uh, an equally good way to get through the bar process, but you know, y'all would all feel more relief in the process if you could do it right at the start. Yeah. I dealt with Steve Isaacs last year with a third year WNL student who I'm dealing with people who approached me about a problem she had when she was a juvenile. Uh, I called Steve, talked to him, discussed the problem, and the if you've met Steve, the thing that comes across is they're not there to bust your chops, they're not there to weed out lawyers or try to keep cumbers down. He was very helpful, very friendly, and what Don just said is what he stressed. The fact that this person was coming forward early and addressing the problem was what was important to the extent that he told me it's not a problem. I think that the uh the difficulty is, and, and this is the other two groups of you, there's one, gr there's one group in here, another, the second group, that is aware of how stress affects you and are aware of how you cope with it, either negatively or positively. I really want to ask you to raise your hands but <laughs> <laughs> to find out who's in which groups. And then there's the third group of you here who are not aware of how stress affects you. You just are kind of rolling along and everything seems to be okay. Now this good question here was about the fact that there are going to be events in your life that are going to uh, intersect such that you're going, you're going to have to deal in a positive or a negative way with the impact of the stress on you. A lot of the current research about this, which is so interesting to me, comes, comes out of uh, efforts to really evaluate peak performances for athletes. Uh, you know, I had a son who played Division I soccer in college, you know, and uh, these guys were always just that close to a serious injury when they were really performing at their peak. You know, they were pushing it that far. And uh, so if you're going to be a good lawyer, you're going to push it. And the difficulty for you that's out there and the difficulty behind your question is that there is not a template there for how to do it right for you. You're going to have to discover what is your own template to deal with stress in a healthy way. Whether it's stress that comes from just wanting to be the best lawyer in this particular area or it's stress that comes because everything's going along and then a member of your family dies uh, or some tragedy happens and you're Im impacted in a way that you have not learned how to, to deal with that. So it's the difficulty that I see here is that you know I don't have a, a handout I can give you that'll be applicable to everybody because everybody's neurobiology about how they deal with this is different. And you know Stress can really be helpful to you if you know how to manage it. It can really make you the best lawyer possible. You know, it's, there's something about, I did commercial litigation when I was practicing, and there's something about these big lawsuits when you're working all the time that, you know, you do turn a corner and, and you really uh, find that you can raise the ante in your own ability to perform as a lawyer. But you've got to be able to handle the negative aspects that go with that at the same time. So just think a little bit about which group you're in. If you, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Um, I just had a follow up to the first question that you asked. Um, in terms of disclosure, like specifically, like what do you have to disclose about depression? Like if some, a family member died and you went to like the school counselor or like student health counselor for grief counseling for like two days, do you have to disclose that? Um, specifically that instance, you would not have to disclose. They're real specific in Virginia about um, what diagnoses you have to disclose and at what time period. Um, that, that you would not have to disclose, although I would certainly get in touch with your provider to see what they diagnose because if they're filling insurance, they might have diagnosed something that may fall into those categories, but probably not. Um, and the other thing is, is they don't care that you've gone to see somebody. They just care that you followed the recommendations that that person gave you. Um, they're actually thrilled when they see people completed treatment successfully because that shows maturity um, and uh, a 
being conscientious about your health and your well-being. That's what they want to see if you practice law. The Board of Law Examiners wants you to be able to practice if you if you pass the quiz and you're otherwise okay. So the worst thing you can do is if there's an issue, not get help for it when you need it. Because it, it means that medically it's going to get worse. Uh, the long-term consequences can, can be much worse. And being able to show that you got treatment and got help and you did that is, is the kind of thing that Jim's talking about that's really helpful for him. Any other bar examination questions? Okay. Let's see here. My name is Tiffany, and I'm an alcoholic with a law degree, two bar licenses, a criminal record, and a great career. I nearly lost all of this four years ago. The DEA asked us to think about ways to get law students to address substance abuse and mental health issues. Apparently there are a lot of good students with issues and most aren't getting the counseling they need. What kind of issues are we talking about? Drinking, drugs, depression. <laughs> Apparently they're called the three Ds. Yeah, you know, actually I read this uh, statistic that law students are actually way more depressed than normal students and the numbers just get crazier once you're in practice. <laughs> I don't see that here. Are you kidding me? What about, what's his name, who passed out at the barbecue the other night? <laughs> and that other guy who's always talking about popping pills all the time. Okay, okay. We find that law student. What do y'all think of that? Is that, well, if y'all were sitting around the table, would you have the same kind of conversation if Dean Emery asked you to reflect on were there problems with depression or drinking too much? Or? You notice it's hard for them to talk about it, actually. It's sort of, uh, they're doing it and giggling kind of at the same time. Uh, it's just, the reality is that the talking about this, particularly in the kind of culture that we, we live in, is, is hard. And talking about what's really going on or talking about somebody you're worried about. Uh, you know, there are going to be people in your, in your class who, uh, you will be worried about. You'll be worried about their use of alcohol or you'll be worried about whether they're dealing with depression issues. And the difficulty there is, um, you know, just avoiding the whole thing. It's so easy just to kind of uh, laugh it off in a way and just think, well, uh, they'll grow out of it or this is just a phase we're all going through. And um, that is true for a lot of people but it is not true for a huge segment of the law school population. As we'll see, because of the nature of the stress and because of the fact that, you know, many of you are kind of pretty hard-charging folks, uh, that uh, you have the kind of personality, you have some of the, the kind of history which makes these things more likely to become problematic, unless you're in this group that's learned to be aware of when you're stressed and how to uh, deal with it. Any insights here that that little conversation of students brings up? Can I ask another question? I'm Susan Grover from William and Mary. So, is the because of the current climate where we have so much stress around the job market and around just the finances and things like that, is there a bigger problem with drugs? or depression than it would be most years? Or? Stress is higher, just generally. Yeah. I don't I don't know that anybody really talks so much about like, hey, so-and-so is popping pills, or hey, so-and-so needs to go and see a psychotherapist. But like, <laughs> you know, they, you know, people are just freaked out, you know? And, and they walk around and, and they look a little bit more somber, but that's about the only real sign that you get. Good question, Susan. Yeah. What about at William and Mary? I think we're having a terrible time over there. 
Uh, I, when, every time somebody comes into my office and says they've got a job, I'm, I'm saying, you're kidding. Because there's just, <laughs> there are so many people who they had jobs and they were taken back and just it's been such a mess. So there's an awful lot of stress. And I, but I'm not, since I'm on the faculty, I'm not in a position to see substance abuse. And the only depression I hear about is, you know, individuals who have it don't do well. So I'm, I don't really hear it the way your deans might or something. I'm just curious. Is oh yes, please. Can I, just add, I don't know, like I'm not, I don't know enough about <clears throat> uh, depression or anxiety, like to diagnose people. But there's lots of stress. Uh, a friend of mine threw up before our midterm that wasn't even graded. <laughs> mm -hmm. So people are getting really uh, anxious for no reason. Mm -hmm. I think the economy also compounds yeah. this, 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 this stress. Generally. Yeah. I was talking to this lawyer, uh, you know, just in the past couple of weeks, and he's been out of work for 16 months. He was working for a large national firm in their Charlotte office, you know, uh, in the field of financial derivatives. <laughs> and. Uh, it is it is very disheartening after a while to be qualified to do a particular occupation and not be able to find a job. So we really work a lot with people like that on how to deal with emotional resi resiliency and really how to be able to, to cope with your own internal perspective on life when you, when you have that kind of situation. We'll talk a little bit about some of those tools too because that's, that's kind of something that I'm sure is going on now with the job market. But yeah, the job market and the, and the current levels of anxiety around that, that Jared and I hear about, and I'm, I'm sure Dean Ballinger as well, was kind of the impetus for, for offering this program. And, and hopefully, um, for people who weren't here, it is going to be a podcast, so you might just let your friends know. ...are coping with competing pressures, some of which they may have never encountered before, at least in the way they're presented in the law school setting. For example, the Socratic method is new and can be troublesome for some students. Also, there is a systemic lack of feedback that is designed in the first year long program that gives pause to many students who just certainly want to know how they are performing. That feeds into anxiety. As long as students can put it in context, then they can usually succeed. However, often those pressures overcome them and they don't find that they have coping mechanisms to address this new professional environment in which they find themselves where the stakes are very high. So uh, let's just talk a little bit about what this, you know, the neurobiology of stress a little bit. And, you know, there's been so much really interesting research lately and, uh, you know, you see like the cover of Time Magazine with the brain on it and, and all this, all this good brain science that's that's out there now. Uh, we know a whole lot more than we did five years ago. Uh, there's a little book out there called, you know, Why uh, Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And that kind of sums it up. But if you, if you remember watching the, um, one of the wildlife programs on TV and you, and you see the gazelle or the zebra out there and then all of a sudden the cheetah comes out and Maybe the cheetah got the prey, maybe the prey got away. When the, when the prey got away, the camera will then turn around and pan on the gazelle or whatever, and the gazelle's over there just eating grass again. You know, like his or her life was not at stake five minutes ago. The biology of that is that when we get under stress, our sympathetic nervous system turns on, and it... It releases neurotransmitters in our brain, which affect us throughout our body. And it's like, uh, let's get out the life raft, we have to get out off the ship. In other words, everything that normally goes on to make your body healthy is jettisoned for the moment because the survival response is necessary, is felt to be necessary in this moment for you to be okay, for you to survive. And what the reason the zebras don't get ulcers, of course, is the fact that 
once their sympathetic nervous system turns on and the danger is over, their parasympathetic nervous system turns on and cuts it right back off again. What happens for us is we get stuck with it on and we don't engage in the kind of behaviors or conduct that's going to turn it off again easily. Or we get stuck with it on at kind of a low grade. And because it is this kind of lifeboat situation, it's very detrimental to the body, what's going on internally, when your stress response is stuck on. It's, uh, you know, you're, you're not doing the proper things for breathing or other things, you're just getting ready to run. <laughs> the fight or flight thing. So that's the difficulty with the stress and we all have an individual way in which we respond to that. And, but if we, if we don't learn to be aware when our response is on uh, and how to deal with it healthily, we will by default learn a non-healthy way to deal with it. Any of y'all got really good ways that you're used to using to deal with your stress? Yes? I sleep. <laughs> <laughs> If you can sleep, that's good. Now, if you're sleeping all the time, that's another, that's another issue. But the, you know, it's, it's these kind of things that your grandmother told you, you know, sleep, nutrition, and exercise that are so basic to being healthy. And uh, exercise is the best thing to deal with the, the cortisol, the other things that get released into your body when you're under stress. It is also the best thing for uh, creating the sort of healthy neurochemicals in your brain, the serotonin, the dopamine, those things that, that make you feel good, that, that make you feel joy and, and things like that. No other, there's no other way to, that does that as effectively. Um, there was a study at Duke not too long ago, and they took several of the medications for depression, I think Effexor, uh, a couple others in, in one group and then this other group they just had a regular hour of exercise each day for four or five days a week. At the end of this, the study uh, those taking the medications were, were no better off. A year later those take, doing the exercise were much better off. So there is a, there's a place for medication if uh, if you're really kind of paralyzed with depression or uh, able not really to function, but all of your medication, all your SSRIs, they just treat the symptom. They don't treat the underlying cause and uh, exercise, talk therapy, those kind of things are the things that are going to help you really get at, at what's going on. So uh, we, are, we all have this difficulty that we we're going to get stressed, so we need to uh, be sure we understand how best to deal with it. And what I, what I see for most lawyers and law students or young lawyers is uh, it's just a lack of awareness, the degree of stress that they're actually experiencing, so they don't go do something about it. And, you know, for some people that can just be having somebody that they're close to to go talk about it. Uh, for me, the exercise part is the most basic one to to deal with stress. That, and then you know, good nutrition and uh, being able to sleep well. And by good nutrition, I mean uh, not a lot of sugar and not a lot of carbohydrates, not a lot of caffeine. The uh, there's some, there's some nutrition folks now who just, you know, call that creating the toxic environment for stress to really work its way. So uh, there is a reason that you have a, a longing for sugar and other things when you're under stress, you know, because it's going to set up something that's going to make you feel some release and, and comfort uh, immediately. Same way with alcohol, you know. You drink so you'll, you'll feel different. So you'll have some release from that. Uh, the long-term results from drinking alcohol, of course, is alcohol is a central nervous system depressant. 
is that they're going to make you <laughs> feel depressed. And that's probably not good. So the, the thing you want to be aware of is how you're coping with stress and what are the things that might not be, m might not be helpful for you. Uh, let's look a little more at the video. See what questions. But about. everybody needs to unwind, right? And bar review is the only real time we can all get together. Bar review is a yeah, bar. Most of us are just having a couple drinks that one night and not doing much else the rest of the week. Yeah, but look at Friday. Half the class doesn't even show up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and uh, what about that guy that got really drunk at the first two bar reviews last year? Didn't his friends have to carry him out? <laughs> I heard he got into a program. I mean, I don't see him out on Thursdays anymore, so I think he got help. And did you hear Sally talk about how she has a second prescription for Adderall from her mom and she was giving pills to pretty much anybody who asked? <laughs> what? Well, yeah, probably until she heard it was a felony. <laughs> You know, so there will be this tendency to try to find the, you know, the shortcuts, uh, you know, like drugs that are prescribed for attention deficit disorder, disorder like Adderall. Uh, it, it will not work out for you long term, though, often to do that. Uh, although uh, there might be something said for, you know, using some of those drugs if you have ADD. Uh, before exams and things like that. The difficulty is if you get into a pattern where that actually tends to exacerbate the stress reaction that you're in. Um, and he, here I'm talking about using people who are not really ADD using, using those drugs. Uh, it, it, can, it can get complicated for you. And I do think that uh, one of the things that that most people who found who suffer from ADD or ADHD uh, is that there are really good behavioral things that they can do to uh, make their ADD work for them. I see a lot of lawyers now who present with symptoms with ADD and ADHD and uh, it's just a question of uh, like your awareness of your stress factor, knowing where those areas are in your life where you have difficulty keeping track of things, setting up the right system, getting the right assistant, uh, and using the positive part of your ADD, your ability to hyper-focus and, and do things in a good way for you. So many of these things that we think of sort of as, as problematic issues, if, if, you, if you use them right, can work for you. Um, one of my board members, who is a physician and very ADD, uh, you know, he he will hyper focus on on a chart for a patient, go in and see the patient, come back out, hyper focus on the next one. So his ADD actually works for him in the in the context in which he practices medicine. I see a lot of lawyers where it works for him in a particular kind of of, of law practice. Other areas of law practice, it does not work at all. So again, it's this whole thing about knowing how you you are personally, you know, how you respond to the the world, and, and the best way to make that work for you. I had so many beers at the pre-bar review event that I never made it to the actual bar review. The details of the night are still a little fuzzy, but I know that I drank so much that I blacked out and then decided to drive home. Uh, being a bit arrogant, rather than going directly home, I stopped for food on the way and found myself speeding down the main street, doing over 50, blasting music, eating french fries, and having no regard whatsoever for my behavior. And that's when I saw the flashing blue lights. Starting in law school, we do see that students experience changes in their behavior, sometimes to their detriment. We see that there can be a shift from the internal rewards as the guiding principle and organizing principle in their lives to one that is focused on external rewards. That can be of concern when taken to an extreme. We see that the ethics of care can give way, sadly, to pessimism or to cynicism. We see that just daily self-care can begin to diminish. For example, 
healthy eating habits, exercise, adequate sleep, all of the healthy, stressful coping mechanisms somehow are not deployed. And sadly, we can see that in some of our students, extremely addictive behaviors take over their lives, including those that are most familiar to us, whether it's alcohol or drug use, even prescription drug use. We see also in some of our students other kinds of addictive behavior, including excessive use of the internet, online chatting, um, sometimes with pornography or excessive shopping, addictions to sex or to gambling. The whole range of addictive behaviors will be manifest in our student population. And that gives us real cause for concern. Oh, symptoms of depression and other mood disorders in law students start showing up at the beginning of law school. Um, prior to law school, law students have the... What Denise is going to say here, and it's been touched on a little bit, is that the um, several studies that have been done show that, you know, when you enter law school in your first year, that students have the sort of normal range within the population of depression and other issues, and by before the end of the first year, that's elevated as much as twice or three times, and same thing is true in second and third year, uh, and same thing is true once you get out. So uh, the the real hard thing is when when everything seems to be going relatively well, even though you know law school is stressful, uh, is to think, well, I'm not going to be the person who's going to fall into having a problem, and. Um, the way for that to be true is just for you to have enough conscious awareness to make good decisions now about about your stress patterns, and uh, and that may not be true for you. The reason people, you know, the clip on the students a little earlier, the reason people want to go out on Thursday to the bar review and get drunk is, you know, they're stressed. <laughs> they feel like they deserve it, or they, you know, it's it's been a hard week. Uh, and so there is nothing wrong with that impulse. That impulse to go out and, and get unstressed is, is a healthy impulse from your body. It's just how you do it that's going to determine you know, whether it's going to be good for you long term. So there, there are many other more positive things now that I know some law schools are doing things like with mindfulness meditation, uh, yoga in law schools things that are going to allow your body to return to that uh, normal sort of state and that will, will be there so you can uh, not go down a default path that's going to be unhelpful. The, you know, your body abhors a vacuum just like the rest of nature. And so if you're not engaging in it in some way, in a positive way, there's going to be uh, a default pattern that's probably not going to be that healthy for you. Um, so. You, you know, that taking a little bit of time to go through and, and see how it's really working for you is, is absolutely key. If, you know, if we thought we might get cancer or any other disease that's really serious, we, we have this little denial thing that goes on. We don't want to look at reality clearly. It's really hard for us to look at our life in something like this and see, well, yeah, uh, I am pretty stressed and I don't have a really good coping pattern. Um, one of the best things you can do, you know, if, if you're trying to develop a, a pattern is to get you an accountability buddy. Get somebody else who y'all will agree, okay, we're going to try to have some positive ways to deal with our stress and we'll, we'll do it together. We'll go running together or we'll play uh, some sport together and we'll, and we'll be sure that we show up and do it and we'll do it on a regular basis. Uh, there's nothing about living a healthy life that is stressed that can't be fun, that can't be enjoyable in the process, but you're going to have to, uh, you're going to, have to be proactive about it. I don't see people at, in, in the legal profession getting there without some degree of consciousness about what's going on and what, you know, what does make their life better. Does that help any? Okay. 
So uh, let's see. Let's run through Denise right quick here. But what she's saying is about the statistics. The depression is the general population, which is just under 10 percent. Um, and after the first year, the incidence of depression and other mood disorders like anxiety disorders jumps up to about 32 percent of the lowest student population. And after the third year. Um, the statistics jump up to 40% of students suffering from symptoms of depression. And even after graduation, lawyers suffer from depression at a rate uh, twice that of the general population. So it's a really, a really big issue for law students to be aware of. Um, lawyers suffer from symptoms of depression, anxiety, um, uh, paranoia, hostility, uh, many other mental health symptoms um, at a rate that's much higher than the general population. Addiction is generally defined as an inability to stop using a substance, to, an inability to stop drinking, for instance, despite negative consequences from that behavior. Um, so even one DUI charge, for instance, is a negative consequence. That someone should definitely look at that if they have a DUI charge. Um, if you think you have a problem with alcohol or drug, one of the things that happens both with depression or the uh, use of alcohol. Um, that is becoming problematic is that your way of coping, uh, being conscious of how you're doing it narrows. It's sort of like your field of vision gets cut cut off. It just, if you're waking up depressed every morning, all of a sudden it seems like, well, that's just the way the world is. And you don't realize that that's not what's going on with most people or how they function. Uh, if, you, if you get into suffering from uh, alcoholism. The you know the subtle thing about that illness is that the disease itself affects how you perceive that you're affected by the disease, and that's that's the reason lots of times you see people who who suffer from alcoholism and they and they don't really get what's what's happening in their life. It gets back to kind of the awareness thing and why that is so important, because once you do move into these statistics if you do that Denise is talking about you, you know your ability to kind of see what's happening to your life becomes constricted that's why uh, good counseling and good therapy is so important particularly early on particularly to, you know to go back to the issues that you raised about your bar application questions you know how important it is to to get that clarity and see what really is uh, going on in your life through the mirror of another person uh, early. We're in the process of completing this survey of sort of wellness and well-being of lawyers in North Carolina and I was just amazed about 11 percent of the lawyers say they're taking medication for depression or anxiety. Uh, when I first started this job it was extraordinarily difficult for me to get somebody to take medication who needed it. Now, people will readily take the medication, but they so often don't, which just deals with the symptoms, suppresses the symptom, they don't, they don't do the next step of, you know, getting some counseling and really understanding what's going on and understanding how to change the patterns. Y'all probably know that uh, if you want to put a new, good, healthy pattern in your life, I think they, the statistics are that it takes like three weeks of doing it. It's the, it's the reason having an accountability partner is good. So that you've got somebody to help you get through those first three weeks. And then because you're feeling better after that, it becomes self-reinforcing. And it begins something that just you enjoy doing as part of your life. So I know we're getting close on our time. Kimberly, you want to introduce our next guest right quick. And, and then we can have more discussion if, if you can stay. But I do want to... Um, introduce Kate Gibson, um, who has joined us from the Elson Student Health Center here at UVA. Um, and Kate has a very interesting perspective. She is a JD from Harvard um, who decided um, to leave the law and become a psychologist. So she, <laughs> probably a very good thing. Um, and she's going to just address um, the issue of, of um, some resources here at UVA for um, you or, or others if you know um, folks who may need some Hi. Yeah, if you'll indulge me for just a couple minutes. Um, to, you know, I thought Don's presentation was really helpful um, to give you like a slightly different description of things. The way I think of stress that's not okay is when the amount of stress you're feeling is 
unbalanced by how much coping ability you feel like you have. And, and the way that that I think is helpful because it suggests two ways of dealing with the problem. One is to try and bring down the stressors and the other is to try and bring up the coping, preferably both. Um, and you know, and I think it's important, um, a couple things. One, one of the things that people don't realize is even good change is stressful. So you get that perfect job at a law firm, but then you got to prove yourself and you got to move to a new town and you meet new people. And so, so even the stuff that you think, wow, I'm checking off the boxes, doesn't mean it's easy, doesn't mean it's straightforward. Um, the other thing, like in my experience, both kind of personally and professionally, you know, a lot of you got here one of two ways. I mean, either sort of just working incredibly hard to master everything or power cramming at the last minute and short-term memory is tremendous. Usually neither of those work in law school. There's too much information and, you know, one exam worth 100% of things just doesn't cut it. And so, so the strategy that got you here has gotten you here. So it's helpful, but it has its limits. And I think that's something else that people don't really necessarily talk about is you know, maybe there's adjustments that you have to make. The other thing I see is people see stress as like the sprint, the hurdle. So I get through the bar review application and then I'm going to be happy. Or I get to the end of the semester and then I'm not going to be stressed. Well, let me tell you from my perspective, it never ends. Like changing professions, I'm still stressed some of the time. So, you know, thinking of it as lifelong tools that you want to learn and now's a great time because it's never going to get any easier from that perspective. Um, so when you think about stress, you know, I think a couple things, one of which Don was saying is, you know, there's kind of the long-term life change strategies and then there's the in-the-moment strategies and both of them are really reliant on your knowing yourself and knowing kind of what your stress points are and are you someone that, you know, is always just below kind of stressing out or not, um, so that you can figure out, you know, can I do it on my own with my friends, with other people, or is it something I want to go talk to someone and either because I'm in the middle of it or because I want to sort of, I can see myself getting there and I want to kind of get someone's help to readjust. Um, so like life strategies, I think the ones Don mentioned are great. I mean, health is extremely important. That's kind of foundational stuff. The other one is just humans are designed to be connected to other humans, like we're social beings. And so being with your friends, being with your family, talking to people when you're stressed, there's research that says that helps you manage stress. Unfortunately, those are the things that you kind of first let go of, you know, when you're in that two weeks before exams, it's like, well, I'm going to cut the sleep short and I'm going to eat the stuff from the vending machines and my friends will understand if I don't call them for the next two months. And, and that's actually the point where you most want to be thinking, I don't want to go down that path and I want to ramp it up. Um, so, you know, so, I mean, sort of putting in those things like, you know, what are the things that give me pleasure in life in addition to whatever I'm learning. So are there clubs? You know, is there a spiritual piece of my life I want to do? Who are my friends? You know, what kind of things can I keep in my life so I remember that I'm not just a brain sitting there doing briefs? Because there's a few people I know that that works for. Most of us, we need a little bit more balance in our lives. So, um, you know, so just think about, like, what is that balance for you? What are those things that help you make it? For me, it's things like, you know, if I want to exercise, I join a class because then I've got it blocked out as like, you know, another class time. Whereas if I say, uh, I'm just going to go tomorrow morning, chances are it doesn't happen. So maybe all are better than me at that. But um, so, you know, so things like that. So what relaxes you? What gives you a break? You know, taking a walk in the woods, you know, sitting having a latte with uh, Dawn, you know, so whatever it is, you know, just make sure you add it in. It doesn't have to be hours of your life, but even minutes of your life is better than nothing. Because the other fallacy that a lot of people have is that somehow they're always going to work at peak efficiency. I don't know, maybe y'all can do that, but, you know, sometimes I work at peak efficiency and other times I'm just low energy or my mind's just not cranking. And if you expect that you're always going to be cranking, then you're going to feel stressed out when you're not. Um, and like I said, you know, <laughs> beginning law firm work, you know, the other thing is, what are your boundaries? Like what, 
you know, this is a world, at least in my experience, I worked for a big law firm, no one's ever going to say to you, great job, you've done enough, get out of here. Maybe once that happened to me. More often they're going to say, can you take on more work? We like what you do. You know, how we need that project 2 a.m. this morning. And you're the one who's going to sort of have to figure out, like, what can I do and what, like, is kind of beyond me at this point. Like, when do I need to say I need to go home to the spouse or I want to go to that squash game? Because no one else is going to do it for you and there's a lot of pressure to keep working because that's kind of how law firms work. And, and I think law school is the same way. Like, how much studying is enough? Well, you can always do more. And so, so it's really important for you all to start thinking, how do I figure out what's good enough? You know, like I know the material pretty well. Boy, if I studied 10 more hours, maybe I get an extra point on the exam. On the other hand, I could sleep. Um, and you know, if you're not thinking of those things, no one's, no one's really going to do it for you. And it is going to be a struggle. Um, as Don was saying, I mean, I think we all feel stress. You know, American is just, you know, modern society is stressful. But it doesn't have to kind of push you under so that you get depressed or you get anxious or you abuse substances. You can sort of say, yeah, there's times I'm going to be stressed, but I have confidence I can cope with it. And you know, and, and you can plan ahead. Like, who doesn't think they're going to be stressed two weeks before exams in May? Nobody. So, you know, so, so how are you going to manage that time so you get through to May 14th or whatever it is without, like, crashing and burning? Um, it's good stuff to think about. Um, wanted to mention a couple in the moment strategies that you can do. There's lots of techniques to try and relax yourself. And Don mentioned a lot of them, yoga, um, meditation, things like that. Um, you know, there's a lot of just sort of physiological things like um, if anyone here does yoga, sort of diaphragmatic breathing or ways to work on relaxing your muscles to try and relax you down. Um, YouTube online stuff is a great resource for that. Like if you put in relaxation or muscle relaxation, you'll come up with a bunch of hits. If any of them help you kind of, um, you know, get in a Zen place, download them to your MP3 and listen to it sometimes. Um, you know, there's lots of things about how you think about stressors. Like, do you think about them, this is something I can manage and here's my plan? Or do you say, wow, I'm totally overwhelmed and I'm shutting down? And so, you know, plan your lives. Like, break stuff into, you know, dealable with chunks of work, information, whatever, so that, wow, I can do, you know, a chapter from torts on Tuesday. That doesn't seem un unmanageable. Whereas if I say, I have to read 500 pages in the next four weeks, then you're just going to go out and watch TV or, you know, have a drink. <laughs> so, you know, you want to you wanna work with yourself to figure out what makes it seem possible to do what you need to do um, and what doesn't feel like it's too much for you. And so let me then get to my assigned thing, which is, you know, so what happens if that's not working for you and you need more help? Well, one option is CAPS at Student Health. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about our services. We see any student who pays the student fee here. Um, you can come through our system in a couple ways. Um, one is if you're in a crisis and feel like, you know, something's really wrong and you need to be helped immediately, we have walk-in hours every day between 11 and 4. You can just come in. Um, the only wait you'd have is if other people have also walked in. Um, you know, you'll be seen that day. We also have what we call, you know, an initial appointment. We call it an intake appointment. You can call up, you know, find out what times are available and set up an appointment and come in and consult with someone tell them what's going on and you and they can think together about kind of what are good next steps. Sometimes it's, um, you know, we actually were really fortunate in Charlottesville. There's this wonderful community of therapists in town. So sometimes that seems like a better option. You know, the counseling center, we tend to see people on a short-term basis. And so if that seems like a good fit, you know, great. We do have some part-time psychiatrists on staff. So um, there's always the option if medic, you know, if things are you know, gone so south that we really need to muster all our resources. That's another possibility. There's psychiatrists in town as well. Um, you know, but there's other resources in town. You know, I hope you do know about CAPS and, you know, we're on the stu student, I mean, we're on the UVA website. So, you know, look us up if you have any questions or you can't remember everything I'm saying. Um, 
But you know, if you're involved with a church or religious community in town, that can be a great source of support. You know, look at you know, all the deans and lawyers assistants people you have here. I mean, those are all people that can help because, you know, it sometimes is the expert help, but it sometimes is just not feeling alone and feeling like there's a plan that can help you get to a better place. So Dean Ballinger, you know, she and I talk all the time. I know she talks to students all the time. I'm sure there's other folks I don't talk to who do that. So, you know, that's these people's job. That's what they're here for. That's what they like to do. Don't be constrained from going to see them. Um, you know, peers, I mean, I know first years have the sort of second or third year peer advisors. You know, that's another, like, great place. I mean, they're going through it just like you are, and, you know, they're not some old fogey. So maybe they're a good person to talk to. You know, and so kind of look at your life and see who are the people, what are the circumstances that can be helpful to you. and use as many of them as you want to. It's not like they run out. Um, I also, I brought a few brochures up and back. You're welcome to take them. Um, Martha, uh, Dean Ballinger will have them in her office as well. Um, but if anyone has any questions for me, I'm very happy to answer any I can. Or actually questions for Dawn. Any yeah. questions? I, I wonder if you could say a few words for the faculty and administrators in the room because I you know, how can we be advocates for students? Sometimes mm -hmm. I think that high achievers have been successful yeah. in striving for perfectionism. Yeah. And now you're telling them not to. Right. So, and yeah. there may be, there, and, and, and as, as staff and faculty, we may be unconsciously giving subtle rewards for being overwhelmed and stressed out. And yeah. Yeah. That's, we say it's bad, but really. Yeah. So I think that's a hard thing in our society because there's a premium on perfectionism. Well, I don't know about you, but I never met anyone who's perfect. And you can break your heart trying to do it. And so, you know, again, I really like the concept of good enough. It's a sort of psychological concept. So, you know, can you set your standards so that what you're doing is good enough without being perfect? I mean, I talk to other grad students, for example, you know, um, and I'm sure this is true of law students, but if you only had one class and infinite time to do it, my bet is about 95 or 100 percent of you would get an A in that class, but you don't. And so what do you do with that? You have to balance the whatever many you take, five classes and the law review and the interning and the clerkships. And, and I can tell you from working in law, it's not like you're ever going to have the one case you can work on all the time. So, you know, just to think together, is it okay for me to say the A minus is okay, or um, I really can go for that weekend away with my girlfriend because I'm doing good enough? You know, for people who are used to achieving, there's a kind of fantasy that if you don't get an A, you're getting an F. Well, that ain't true. You know, there's a whole range between that. And I can tell you, after my first job, no one ever asked me what my GPA was in law school. They didn't care. So, you know, so it's important. You know, I wouldn't say don't try and get good grades. It helps you get those interviews. But, you know, when you're 50, you're not going to remember what your GPA in law school was. I hope. <laughs> Would it help if from time to time the faculty member said, you know, this is going to be a job, this is law school, you do need something outside your life. They heard it from a faculty member. Yeah. You know, I mean, when I was law school back in the 70s, it's just like you said, it was this one, this one, this one, this. But ironically, as I got in the second year, I met two law school, became close to law school professors, and they stressed to me, so they took my money in poker games that, you know, I want to ask all of these wishes. Um, that, you know, there's a life outside of law school. And you just kind of have to put it all in perspective, I think. And it really helped that that came from two law school professors yeah. um, who tell me, the one, Ron Baskin, one of the very, very well known experts in criminal law, that he notices a difference in the law students now than he did back when I went to law school in that regard mm -hmm. that. Seeking perfection. Mm -hmm. And I'm married to one that there's nothing between an A and F, and I have a daughter. 
there's right. nothing between an A and that. Right. She went to Columbia School of Journalism, what really pissed her off was this past bank. <laughs> she didn't like that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you talk to, you know, any of you and tell your own life experiences, I bet none of you just work. And, and you know, what I think is really important is to try to connect the student back to his or her core values. You know, I keep getting back to this idea that there's no one template that fits everybody. And that where kids usually go astray, in my view, is when they're trying to do something to fit a projection of what they think they ought to be doing. It's somebody else's concept rather than really connecting with who they are. So if, if you just ask the student kind of curious questions about what they really value in their life and what's important, and then allow them to see how they can put that together in a combination, like she was saying, that this is going to be okay, this is going to work for them. Yeah. Uh, that connection in there is, there have been several studies on, on how law students have, have gotten more uh, the psychological term would be externally referenced. Uh, you, but you get the idea. They're less connected with self and who they really are. And that's what also helps them get emotionally astray. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dean? Well, speaking of um, perfectionism, um, one thing I think is important, particularly in a law school like this, is to make an appropriate adjustment of expectations of yourself. I mean, everybody who is a student at this law school was at least in the top 10% mm -hmm. of his or her class wherever they were. They're here now and 90% of the students are not going to be in the top 10% <laughs> right. anymore. And that's, you know, that's something that has to be recognized. When my older son was a student here, Pam Carlin, who used to teach here, now teaches at Stanford, drew a big triangle mm -hmm. on the board and she sliced off the top and she said all of you are up here some of you are going to be at the peak some of you are going to be close to the line mm -hmm. of what I've sliced off and you're going to feel like you're not good enough or that you are in a lower place than in fact you are what you need to remember is you are still right up here mm -hmm. in the peak. You might be a little lower than you wish within that elite group. But I think it's trying to get um, a better perspective of you have now moved into a group of extraordinary people, one of which you are. You know, where mm -hmm. you fit in that group is not nearly as important as that you are a right. very smart person in an excellent school. And, and I would add to that that while it's not a complete disjunct between being smart and getting good grades and being a good lawyer, it's not a complete overlap either. I mean, some of the best lawyers I know did not go to a top 10 law school and did not have the greatest grades, but they got chops. And so, you know, it's easy you've spent what, 16 years or 15 years in school? So it's easy to think that that is the measure and the yardstick of how you'll do. And, and it's a good start. I mean, being smart is a great thing and working hard is a great thing, but it doesn't mean you know, that that's the only thing that gets you to the kind of life you want to lead and being a good lawyer. In fact, I think you'll find in practicing law, if you have skills that are different from just being smart, you will do better. Uh, you know, I don't know why, but I did well in law school, but my, uh, my emotional IQ has probably always been better than my intellectual IQ. I was real good as a trial lawyer because I knew exactly what those jurors were thinking all the time. It, none of that I learned in law school. Uh, but I learned it through other circumstances in my life that had, that kind of forced me to have that ability to learn that. So these, all of these ideas about being healthy and being conscious of, you know, are kind of about your emotional intelligence. And they will all help you in the practice of law as, as well as in the other areas of your life. You know, it, it, there are other ways to, to know in all other than just 
the book knowledge we get in law school. know what state we're taking the bar in yet, um, but we do have something to report. Mm -hmm. um, who should we consult so that we can have a track record? Since you're in Virginia, I would do it here. Yeah. If, if you don't know which state you'll actually end up in. We, we in North Carolina, I've monitored law students and lawyers for many other states. And to demystify, um, we see a lot of law students in CAPS. <laughs> so you wouldn't be the only one. I just want to answer the question about <clears throat> what faculty members can do for their students. Um, I have a couple of professors that give passes that recognize that some weeks we're going to have briefs due or something else that we're going to be too concerned about and probably not going to read. And so instead of like having being forced to embarrass ourselves in class, you, you can like email him. And, I need a pass for this day. And that really like helps, you know, kind of manage your time and feel less guilty that you're ignoring something. I got cold call the day my brief was due. And I'm <laughs> like, I'm I'm very sorry about this case. And it was mortifying. But I think also if we if this is just for Virginia, but whatever the meaning is at your school, there was so much emphasis put here on the three thirty. And I remember I got my first semester and I panicked. I, I I really didn't know what to do, and I, I wish that somebody would have told me, you know, like, it's a mean. Half of the class is below that mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, because that was not what I had thought, you know, I was like, I'm going to get that 3-3. Three, three. It's going to be perfect, and I'm going to get this great job, and then all of a sudden you have a B without a plus after it, and I was like, I will never have a job, I will never work. <laughs> and I have to go home and live with my parents and bring in this $150,000 debt, and then I'm like, I wish this would be the, and I know we're near wrap up time, but the other thing about dealing with stress is that some of y'all have probably seen this book by Eckhart Tolle, now, The Power of Now. The more present you are, the less you're not stressing about the future. <laughs> and so all these practices about being present and being aware of what's actually happening in the moment are real good ways to live life and uh, following you know what you were saying about there's always another future thing if you're, if you're just focused on that that will really accelerate the stress experience well I think we'll just wrap up formally thank you both very much